I, I don't know if it's always been this way or maybe specifically more and more with the internet, but have you ever noticed that your opinion is continually asked for? Like all the time, your opinion is asked for. Companies send out letters, they send out emails, uh, they make phone calls, and they ask you things like, what do you look for in an insurance provider? Or what do you think that you would want in a restaurant? Sometimes you get those calls. Uh, if you visit a place or do business with a place, they'll say, "Can uh, come back and write a review. Some places offer you money to come back and do that. They, they want to know what you liked, what you didn't like. They want feedback about what happened when you tried them. And they want you to give you, like, they want you to give them, like, a, uh, oops. I'm a, my things are all backwards. Can you click the last, the last one? Sorry. Click on the very last slide. There we go. So people ask you to rate them, four out of five stars. Have you ever done that? You're looking for a restaurant or someplace to go in a new area, and you stop and say, like, okay, what kind of ratings does it have? You know, that's available to you. And then also you can add your two cents in there, throw it in there, give your opinion on it. Um, if you connect to the World Wide Web, you can create a blog with your thoughts. You can go on social media and give someone's else, someone, someone else's post. You can give them a like or a love, or you can reply with what you're thinking about what they posted. Or if you're, near, if you're in proximity to someone, either you live with them or you're friends with them or maybe even married to them, you might be asked, what do you think about this outfit? And you know that can be a trap. But you just don't answer the question sometimes about what, what, is it, what do you think about that outfit? What do you think about their hair? What do you think about the latest choice in life that they've made? But we are continually asked for our opinions. So much so that we, sometimes we don't even wait to be asked. We just give them and offer them to people. Maybe that's why we become so passionate about things that are simply opinion, right? We can say we approve of someone, we disapprove of someone, we're not sure about it, but sometimes we get really passionate about it, don't we? And if someone disagrees with our opinion, sometimes we can, we can start to dip our toes into being really upset with them. Ask someone who the very best football team is, and pretty soon a heated debate will start with people who care about such things, even though everyone knows that the Ohio State Buckeyes are the best football team there is. Um, or maybe you start playing Christmas music, and soon you'll have people, without being asked, <laughs> tell you that it's way too early for Christmas. Now, I personally enjoy the idea of Christmas in July, not just because it's my birthday, uh, but because of just it's fun to think about Christmas. I don't think it's ever too early to celebrate Christmas, and I like to just categorize it as celebrating Jesus. Uh, but, you know, I thought it was really cool that one of the cable stations actually was showing National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation this last July 25th, because it was Christmas in July. Restaurants, cars, trucks, music style, musical artists, movies, clothes, phones, soda, and candy. The list goes on and on. We all have opinions about these things, and we usually don't shy away from giving our opinions. And that's fine in general, and there's nothing necessarily that, that is inherently bad about that. But what if in our hurry to always share our opinion, to share what we think, we have the potential to do damage to both relationships and even communities because we're just sharing what we think about people? Now today we're going to be in James chapter 4. We were there last week as well. We're going to be a little further down. And, and when James is writing, what he is, is addressing is Jewish Christians outside of the city of Jerusalem. And he's giving instructions to them as they lean into their faith in Jesus. And he's giving them instructions on, on kind of how to live together. Now if you remember last week at all, or if you remember the first 10 verses of James chapter 4, really the overarching theme there is Pride versus humility. Now, the context for today's pas uh, passage is James continuing to address these ideas of pride and arrogance. So hopefully, if you've had time to either turn there in your Bible, tap there in your app, or if you don't have something with you, we will have it on the screen. But let's see what James has to say, beginning in verse 11 of James chapter 4. Here's what he says. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to, dis to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Now these two verses 
begins speaking about the community of believers. How do we know that? Because he says, brothers and sisters. Do not speak evil against your brothers and sisters. We know this because he says that. And so what is his encouragement? Don't speak evil against them. And how does he classify speaking evil? Two words. Criticize and judge. He says, when you criticize and when you judge your brothers and sisters, you are speaking evil. He's saying that falls under the umbrella of speaking evil. Both of these words are rooted in guess what? To be critical of someone and to judge someone involves our opinion, right? First, we have the critic. It takes no real skill, skill, it takes skill, I went a little southern on you there, sorry. It takes no real skill to be a critic, does it? It only takes a negative opinion. I mean, a lot of times people say, hey, here's, here's everything you did wrong, and most people that are doing anything know what they did wrong. They don't need help with that, but some people love to tell you everything you did wrong. Now, when I go to McDonald's drive through which happens way more than I would like since I have two younger girls, both 10, 10 and 8, their inner food critics come out to play and come out to speak. They say, I want mine with no pickles. The other one says, I want extra pickles, no onions. Now, so what has qualified them to criticize the McDonald's cheeseburger? Is it their years of culinary experience? Is it their vast sampling of cheeseburgers from around the world? Nope. It's taste buds. That's relative to them, what they like and what they don't like. They were born with them. They didn't earn them. There's no real skill there. It's just a personal opinion. And that's really a critic at its basic form. Maybe even its harmless form when it comes to McDonald's. But James isn't talking about Happy Meal cheeseburgers. He's talking about others in the community, the brothers and sisters in faith. If you look around the world, if you look around at the word, not world, word, used, that is translated as criticized, it has a few other interesting synonyms that maybe we don't hear so much about. One of those is the word backbiting. Ever heard that word backbiting? It's not something that gets said too much anymore, but backbiting infers an attack against someone relatively close from where? Behind, right? I mean, you have to be pretty close to bite somebody, don't you? I mean, you have to be within biting distance. And most of us, unless you're like a dog or a wolf, you're not going to lunge, you know, you don't have the snout to get it. But you have to be pretty close, but it's from behind. What's interesting when you think about the community of faith and we talk about putting on the armor of God, what is one place that is not protected by the armor of God? Our backs. Why is that? Because that's where our allies are supposed to be. That's where our family and our friends are supposed to be behind us. We're supposed to trust that they got our back, not that they're biting our back. Now, another term that has meaning that I saw written in multiple places about this passage that I had never even actually heard of um, is a pretty unique word. It's called, it's a traducer. Traducer. A traducer is one who attacks the reputation of another by slander or libel. Now, slander and libel both infer that it's misinformation or lies that people are sharing. But if you like definitions... The difference between slander and libel is, is speech versus print, right? Now, if I, say, if I say something and I attack your reputation and say that person is a no-good so-and-so, they're no good, that's slander. If I write it or type it or text it instead, that's libel. And so a traducer, this word traducer, I'm using it because I think it's unique and it might, might be something we remember. A traducer is critical of a person to others, either through speaking, texting, or writing. And they do damage to their reputations with half-truths, lies, or misinformation. That's a traducer. Now you might say, what if I share information and I thought it was true, but I realized later it wasn't. Well, maybe instead of slander or libel, you'd simply be a gossip. Now, it doesn't, James doesn't talk about gossiping in this passage, but we have lots of other passages that speak to gossip. But gossip at its base level is any information about people that are not you. True or otherwise. Sometimes people say, well, what I shared was true, so it's not gossip. Well, that's not true. Gossip involves information about other parties, not yourself. 
at its base level. And so what happens is sometimes people say, well, I don't like the prayer request line, not at this church, I'm talking about like other churches, but I've, I've heard people say, I don't like prayer requests because it turns into gossip fest. That's because there's a, there's a thin line. And it's easy to breach from one into the other. Usually, I think it starts to turn into gossip when we start to share our opinion on it. That's usually a good rule of thumb that I've used over the years. But gossip at its base level is any information about people who are not you, true or otherwise. Now, here's what's interesting, I think, in the way that we speak about people and that why we think it's okay is because politics has trained us that with the way we beat someone else's argument isn't to attack their argument, or even defend ours, is to attack the person making the argument. Have you, been, have you ever learned this or heard this or seen it? You know, in politics, they say, well, I'm going to go ahead and fight dirty because they're fighting dirty. What happens is we get away from the message and we attack the person. We bring up the fact that they had a parking ticket three years ago they never paid. And we're saying, well, can you trust what they're saying? Because they never paid their parking ticket. Or maybe they lied about their weight on their driver's license. I mean, nobody in here has ever lied about their weight on their driver's license, I'm sure. But you know people that probably did. And so you can say, hey, don't, I wouldn't listen to what they're teaching. They lied about their weight on their... Or you know what? Maybe they rooted for Michigan in a football game, and you're like, oh, well, we can't trust anything they have to say if they've done that. What that is, is we attack the person rather than the argument or the point they're making. And so politics has trained us to do that. These all attack their reputation and the character, not the actual point of contention. That's what a traducer does. They bring up the person's character. They try to slander them. They do it through libel. And James says there is no room for that in the blessed community of Jesus Christ known as the church. Now, the second word that James uses here to explain speaking evil is to judge. Now, there's different kinds of judging. So I thought I'd look up this one to be sure as well. And the implication here, using the context of what James is writing, is to pronounce a strong disapproval of someone else, it is someone who acts the part of arbiter, where'd it go, yeah, it's someone who acts the part of arbiter or judge in the matters of common life, passing judgment on the deeds and words of others, specifically finding them guilty as to be condemned. So what this means is we look at what someone is doing and saying, well, they're going to hell. That's what he's talking about. Is that you're judging what someone is saying, what someone is doing, that's not specifically lined out in the Bible. You know, there's areas of life that come up that aren't specifically dealt with in the Bible. And people look at something and they say, you know what? That person's going to hell for that. That person, you know what? They're lost. They're lost hope. I give up on them. That's kind of judging them, isn't it? That's what he's speaking of. Finding guilty to be condemned, passing judgment on the deeds and the words of others. Now, just a few ideas thoughts on this idea. First, there are some people that don't know the difference between judging someone and stating fact. Because they'll say something like, that kid is lazy. And then they'll follow it up, I'm not judging them, I'm just stating a fact. If you have a hard time distinguishing the difference between facts and judgments, think of it this way. One of them produces a label. This kid doesn't, does not work or clean their room versus this kid is lazy. Which of those is a fact? Anybody know? I mean, this is an imaginary kid, so we're not speaking about your kids, I know, but... The top one, right? That's a fact. It's, everybody can look at that and say, they didn't go to work. Yep, they didn't go to work. They didn't go to work. Is their room clean? No, the room's not clean. Those are facts. Judgment is when you slap a label on it. That person is lazy. Now, you might not be able to get everybody around to say, oh, I agree with that label, but it's still a judgment. So that's the difference. The Dewey Decimal System at the library, oops. the Dewey Decimal System at the library is a good example of an effective system of labeling for organization, right? That's a label. Although a little more relative, the labels of hot sauce packets at Taco Bell Mild, medium, Diablo, and hot magma, those are, are to help you understand how the rest of your day is going to go, right? They're, you lay, they're labeled so that you understand how to categorize them. Now, did you ever have a label maker, or do you, 
Do you have one that you use now? Because some people use labels to organize because it helps put things into proper categories, doesn't it? It makes things easier for sorting if you have a labeled place for them. It kind of cuts through the chaos. Whether it's your spice rack or maybe your cooking ingredients, that your, your junk drawer, maybe you label it as like this is a place for phone cables and this over here is for something else. Maybe you have a supply cabinet and you mark where things go, like this is where the mops go, this is where the cleaners go, that kind of stuff. Labeling helps us put things in their proper place. The problem becomes, though, when we begin to label and sort people within the blessed community of Jesus, specifically speaking, condemnation about them. It's like we start to label them like, I don't have to love that person because you know what? They're going to hell anyway. They don't love Jesus, so they're not really part of this community. Sometimes we begin to do this. I mean, maybe not you, but at least people in the Bible that James is writing to. Because what he says is, is like, he's talking about people that act as if they have all the information on the person they're speaking about. They act as if they see all, know all, and they, and they know their motivation, and they know their relationship with Jesus, and they act like they're a holy label maker, and they're just going to label that person. And then it's almost like they act like it's their duty to withhold love from them while sharing that label with others, saying, you know what, you don't have to mess with that person, they're, they're, they're too far gone. You don't have to do anything with that person, they're a lost cause. And so people carry around these labels that we give them. I think what James is saying here, if you're right in our modern day English, is you're not a label maker. That's not your job. You're not a label maker for God. He is the judge, not you, when it comes to people's relationship with Jesus. And He is the judge, and not you, about where they're going to spend their eternity. God isn't coming to you in the quiet hours of the night and slipping you a 20 and saying, give me that cheat sheet where you've created a nice sorted list that's highlighted and tabbed about who is condemned and who is redeemed. You're not the label maker. People are not books. People are not hot sauces. People are not spices or anything else requiring your categorization. James finishes verse 11 by saying, by saying, if you criticize and judge, then you are criticizing and judging God's law, but your job is to obey the law, not judge whether it applies to you. What I believe James is saying here is when you criticize and you judge other people, and you reach the conclusion that they are disqualified from the blessed community of Jesus Christ, when you come to the conclusion that they no longer have to receive love and service from you, then we are attempting to find an excuse or an out from the law of love. The love that says love your neighbor as you love yourself. The law of love that Christ demonstrated when he showed up to a dinner with a basin and a towel, ready to serve, not to sit back and be served. When we decide to lean in on our opinion of other people with the prideful idea that we have them figured out and know how to sort them, we are saying that doesn't apply to them, that love and that service, because they don't belong here anyway. James reminds his readers that it's God alone who judges. It's God who gave the law, so he is perfectly capable of judging the law, and people himself, as well as it is God alone who has the power to save somebody. You can take a sigh of relief that you do not have to save anybody. Now, we have a responsibility as Christians to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to share the love and the reconciliation that he offers, but it's not our job to save. That only happens through the power of God. I don't know about you, but it can be easy for me to forget this. I don't mean that I forget the idea that God alone judges and saves, but I, I mean sometimes I forget the application that God alone judges and saves. I, I, I know I've found myself getting into a situation where I may be keeping someone at arm's length because I have them figured out, and maybe I've judged them too quickly as a defense mechanism from getting hurt because I've been hurt by people that I've let close to me. So now when people come to me, instead of just giving them love and serving them, sometimes I keep them at arm's length and saying, hey, I, I love you from a distance. Sometimes I, I, I can... I can fall into the, to the thing of, of maybe categorizing people and labeling them to make life more predictable. 
To say, hey, I know what to expect from that person. Hey, I know what to expect from these people. And this is maybe a little more. I need some energy for that. And I don't need some energy for that because things in my past have taught me that that's the best way to get through life. Sometimes, again, this is just me. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes just to make heads or tails of life, to make life easier to get through, I find ways to kind of say, okay, well, I don't need to deal with that today. And if I'm honest, in the past, I, I, I can allow my opinion to lead me to come up with ideas and conclusions that if I asked, I might actually say God probably agrees with me. But God's name isn't Scott. And he isn't asking for my opinion. He isn't asking for my opinion about my brother or my sister in Christ. He isn't asking about my opinion about my neighbor or the people around me. He's asking me to go and love and to serve. He doesn't ask me if I think that they're a lost cause or if they can ever be reconciled to Jesus Christ. Instead, he says, that's my job. I don't have you and join with me in life so that you can go around and place tags on everybody, so you can put labels on everybody, so that when I come back, it's just a whole lot more efficient because you've already done the job for me. No, that's not what he said. That God so loved the world that He sent His only Son, not to judge the world, but to save, to rescue them. I like the way the message paraphrases this passage. It says this, Don't badmouth each other, friends. It's God's Word, His message, His royal rule that takes a beating in that kind of talk. You're supposed to be honoring the message, not writing graffiti all over it. God is in charge of deciding human destiny. Who do you think you are to meddle in the destiny of others? Wow. That's some strong language, isn't it? Who do you think you are? That could, be, that could probably be the title of half of the Bible. Half of the Bible. Remember who you are and remember who you are not. But he says, who do you think you are to meddle in the destiny of others? Do we realize that when we share our opinions about people, when we criticize people, when we judge other people, especially within the, the confines of the Christian community, that we are speaking to the destiny of others? And that sometimes speaking evil about somebody can spread like a cancer throughout a body. Because you can say something like, I don't like the way that they do that. They're probably not even saved. And someone can say, yeah, you know what, I never thought about it, but I don't like that either. You're probably right. And one begets another. If you don't address that at the source, sometimes that gets out of hand. Now, we talk about judging, and there's all kinds of different judging, and sometimes people just liberally slap this idea of judging on this. But I like what this commentator, Dr. Douglas Moo, although a horrible last name that he has to deal with his life, he does have an interesting point about the word judgment here in the context. He says, James is not prohibiting the proper and necessary discrimination that every Christian should exercise, nor is he forbidding the right of the community to exclude from its fellowship those it deems to be in flagrant disobedience to the standards of faith or to determine right and wrong among its members. James, is re James rebukes jealous, censorious speech by which we condemn others as being wrong in the sight of God, especially sharing misinformation falsehood, and bad, just trying to ruin them. I think the good thing about this passage from James, because it's kind of heavy, it's kind of weighty, isn't it? We talk about all this stuff, and it's real life, I mean, right? If we don't talk about it, like, we don't just skip this part of the Bible because it's not easy to talk about. It's heavy stuff. The good thing is that we today are too sophisticated to have these kind of problems that James writes about in a church way back then, right? I mean, that was just probably for them. Like, we, we wouldn't have that in 2023 in America, would we? No one seems that eager to answer, so maybe, I think, of course not. We are not so different from James and his audience over 2,000 years ago. The temptation is always there, I think, to speak evil of a person that we disagree with. And sometimes if we can't find a good reason to disagree with their opinion, we find a way to disqualify them. The temptation is always there to avoid the law of love because we somehow have found a loophole that is justified by our judgment of their character. The temptation is always there, I believe, to pretend to be God, to know all 
that there is and make a clear, sound judgment, unbiased and without emotion to place a label and sort people as a lost cause. The temptation is always there, as much or even more so today than years ago. And that's really what condemnation is, isn't it? To condemn someone. Now, I I don't know about you, but I usually don't hear that word, don't you condemn me. We talk about people. Uh, Usually I hear about more with buildings and structures, right? There are people, typically government workers or some kind of contractor, who survey structures to see if it's fit for carrying out the function they were designed and created for. If these structures are unable to function as designed, then they are condemned as unsafe or uninhabitable, and they're typically marked for destruction. So they're saying, you can't do anything with this structure. You might as well just level it. James' word reminds us people are not structures, but they were created with a purpose. And their ability and uh, suitability to fulfill that purpose isn't decided by other people in their life. It isn't decided by what they've done up to this point, anything in their past. It isn't decided by who they know, what family they come from, what side of the tracks they live on, or what their title and bank account says. A person's suitability to fulfill the purpose given to them by their creator is determined by that very same creator and that creator alone. And so if you have breath in your lungs and you are, and you are more than six feet You're not six feet underground, but you are upright above ground. The same God who created you has shared his power to save you through Jesus Christ so that in partnership with him, you can live into the purpose he has created you for from this point forward. Jesus is always concerned with where do we go from here, not what did you do, other than to say, you know what, God, I was going my own way and now I want to come your way. And so you're never too far gone. He's not going to mark you condemned. Some other people might, but he's not going to. If you surrender your will, your way, and your life to Jesus Christ, if you allow your life, your mind, and your heart, and your soul to be brought into alignment with Jesus, there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Praise be his name. Amen? I'm glad the ones awake said amen, because I thought, man, we're, we're doomed. You might have been marked condemned before you met Jesus, but you met Jesus. And he doesn't have use for that label. He is in the saving and rescuing business, not in the destruction business. He came to save and to rescue and to reconcile, not to destroy. That's the enemy. So don't let yourself be labeled. And don't be a label maker for others. Don't be a traducer. You learned a new word, hopefully. Instead, James would encourage us to be followers of Jesus and let Jesus decide your destiny, not what others have said about you or maybe even what you thought about yourself. The invitation is to join your life to His and let Him transform you. Allow Him to equip you and empower you through His Holy Spirit for the good works that He has planned for you long ago. That's the God we worship. And that's the God that that has saved us. And that's the God that is available to all of us each and every day. Don't let what everyone else is getting wrong about you speak into your life. Instead, lean into being made right by Jesus Christ. One of the ways that we get to celebrate Jesus and what he's done for us is through the act of communion, 